As most of you know, last week I began a mini-sermon series about receiving sinners, like Joseph did in the reading that we had. I told you that the elders and I decided that it would be good to do this series because we've had the opportunity to reach out to a man who may soon be released from a halfway house after serving a lengthy prison sentence. As I mentioned last week, sometimes it can be difficult for church members to forgive and welcome those who have been guilty of serious crimes. This can especially be the case for those who have been themselves hurt by serious crimes, those or those who have been burned in the past by naively trusting a deceptive, hypocritical ex-convict who who made up stories and then took advantage. To make matters worse, sins of self-righteousness, pride, and bitterness in our hearts can play into the whole equation of receiving those who have committed great sins. At the same time, sometimes church leaders can be naive and not take appropriate precautions. Those who are known to have committed serious offenses should be willing to accept certain safeguards that will be put in place, and in many cases, such safeguards should be put in place. We have, fortunately, resources with godly men, with Redemption Prison Ministries, our two prison chaplains in our own presbytery who are able to help advise us with churches that have done reintegration work and certain safeguards that are, are wise to take and that are, are generally are taken. As I put it last week, there is a delicate balance between trusting acceptance on the one hand and prudence on the other that calls for mutual understanding and patience on the part of both the former inmate and the church member. Grace and wisdom will be needed. There are matters that will need to be worked out and discussed with the elders and deacons about how things are handled as far as safeguards and as far as conveyance of warnings to parishioners. And all of this, if we humbly look to the Lord, will be used in our lives to help us grow as believers in wisdom, patience, forgiveness, joy, love, and faith, all sorts of other ways. It will help us to bring forth the fruits that God delights in. I chose as my text the parables in Luke 15, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son. We did part one last week, Christ's reception of those who repent of great sins. First, we saw that the Bible recognizes that there is such a thing as greater and lesser sins. Any sin, even the least, shows us to be rejectors of God and makes us entirely incapable of ever being right with Him apart from Christ. But still, there are some sins that are worse and some that are much worse than other sins. We saw that there are sins for those who profess Christ that rightly call for the expulsion of those who commit such sins and will not repent, expulsion from the church. And that rightly that is to be done. It was so in the old covenant and it is so in the new covenant. We saw in the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin that Christ will search for those, all of those that the Father has given him until he finds them, and then he will rejoice with great joy because he loves to see those who are restored to the Father. He loves to see people restored. He delights in it. There's rejoicing in heaven. Then we looked at the parable of the lost son where we saw the beautiful picture of the prodigal son coming to see what a fool that he was for thinking that life would be better away from his gracious father and away from life in his father's house. He came to his senses and he realized that it would be better to be a slave in his father's house than to be in the world. So he returned hoping that he would be accepted as a slave, at least as that, but to his joyful amazement, his father gladly received him not only as a slave, but as a son, killing the fatted calf to celebrate that his son who was lost had been found and that his son who was dead was now alive. 
What a beautiful picture this is of a welcoming, our welcoming Father in heaven, warmly welcoming great sinners who repent. That was part one. This week is part two. Now we have not such a good example. We're looking at the church's reception of those who repent of great sins. The church is represented in this case by the elder brother. In this sermon, we will look frankly at the struggles that we who are members of the church sometimes have in welcoming those who repent of great sins. This is illustrated by the elder son who became angry when his father welcomed his brother home. I hope that this sermon will help you to become more welcoming of sinners, not because there's a rule about it, about welcoming them, but because you're so delighted with God and with the life that he gives you, and because you so love your brother and are, that you're happy for him when he finds the Lord again. You're pleased when that happens instead of being troubled by that how could one who has done such things be accepted. So I will read again verse 15 to you in its entirety. I mean, verse 15, chapter 15, Luke 15. I'll read it all to you again, though our focus will be on verses 25 through 32. So please give careful attention to the word of God. Luke chapter 15, verse 1, the word of God. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. Now, I just want to mention before we go further that you see that the Scripture, the Holy Spirit speaking in Scripture, refers to these people as sinners. It's not others calling them that, but the Spirit calling them sinners. Why? Because that was their status. They had been people who had been part of the church, but because of sins, great sins that they had committed, that they had not repented of, they were put out of the church. And they could no longer be in the, uh, in the regular worship of God's people. But these are the ones that came to hear Christ. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, so the purpose of this parable is because of these Pharisees and scribes that complained about Jesus receiving sinners. So, so he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which was, is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. And we'll pause there again for just a minute. I think the proper way to interpret that they need no repentance is talking about they don't need repentance the way the tax collectors and sinners do, who had rejected God in his salvation. They had rejected the God of grace and his calling and his salvation and rebelled against him, refusing to repent. They needed to repent and turn to the Lord. And the other 99 had already repented and turned to the Lord. So they did not need to repent, as it says. Now, of course, we all need to repent every day of particular sins that we commit. We, we all sin every day. We ask God, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is a regular thing that we are to pray. But there is a difference, isn't there? If you turn away and you reject the Savior and you go off and walk with Him no more, then there is a, re, a, a, a serious repentance that needs to occur of restoring the broken relationship with Him. And that's what this is talking about, I believe. Uh, okay, then verse 8, continuing on, the next parable. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So Jesus is deliberately using this losing and finding thing to 
show what happens in heaven when a sinner repents, that there is rejoicing there. There is joy. And we should all rejoice when that happens, not be grieved by it. Okay, then he goes to the third parable. Then he said, verse 11, then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And we talked about how that was God's timing when we looked at this last week. Right at the same time that he had spent up all of his capital, he had nothing left, then this famine came that made it difficult to get work and made people more stingy about giving to the poor. Verse 15, Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods, these are carob pods, that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. So these are something that swine can eat, but that people can't really eat very well. It's hard to digest to make him sick a lot of times, but he was so hungry. In verse 17, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he was hoping very much that he could be a servant in his father's house. After all that he had done, that the father would accept him as a servant. And he arose, verse 20, and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven in your sight and am no longer worthy to be your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Now the older son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Now, I want to begin by looking at how these sons were actually really quite similar to one another. Both sons were initially estranged from their father. They had very different ways of showing their estrangement, but both of them had the same kind of thoughts about their father. Hard thoughts. Thoughts that were unworthy of their father. He was not deserving for anyone to have hard thoughts of him. In the parable, he is presented as a very kind a generous and a loving father. His love is seen in the way that he seems to be watching for his lost son, so that before he even reached the house, he saw him coming down the road. And in the way that he also runs to, to greet him, and, and he has servants by his side, and he showers his son with, with kisses and tears. Before the boy can even ask if he might be his servant, the father is already sending servants all over the place everywhere to clothe him as a son with a, the best robe, to find a ring for his hand, shoes for his feet, and the fatted calf for a feast. There is no bitterness in this father, 
only kindness and generosity. My son was lost, and now he is found. He was dead, and now he is alive. His love also is seen to his older son, who resents all of this and becomes angry. You can imagine that a father like this might have been greatly irritated with that and incensed with his son. But instead, at this juncture, he gently appeals to him. Look at this. He does not chide him, but he assures him of his love in verse 31. Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. Then he graciously and gently directs him to what is right. Verse 32. It was right that we should make Mary and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. What a gracious, tender appeal to his elder son by this father. Now, of course, there is no earthly father who is as kind and generous as this father. Estranged sons can always find things to complain about regarding their fathers. But often, very often, their thoughts are also exaggerated. Yes, you can always find fault with a human being, but you can also sinfully exaggerate those faults and play them up and make them big. You see, the son wants to justify, if a son wants to justify his coldness and his lack of love, if he wants to justify his rebellion, then he will exaggerate. That's the way we all are as sinners. We want to make others look worse than they are, and we want to make ourselves look better than we are. And really, you know, this is, this is, the way that we all are. That's why we get in quarrels with people, because we say, you're the one that did wrong. You were the one that was unjust. And that person says, no, it's you. And we go back and forth. Why do we both think the other person? Because we misjudge. We judge so that we're in the best light. This father, though, he is so, he is presented here. The father in this parable is without fault because he represents God the father. God the father has no harshness or bitterness. He has no flaw. He is presented to us to show us, this father in the parable, to show us how undeserving God is when people have hard thoughts of him. And that's very common. I know people that will tell me that they rejected the Lord, and the reason is because they say the Lord is not gracious, that the Lord is not good, that he is a difficult one, and they don't, they don't like him, basically. This father is so kind and generous, it is pure wickedness for anyone to think such thoughts of him. This shows us, you see, how undeserving God is of those hard thoughts. We often do it, though we have these thoughts the way these sons did. So now let's let's look at, uh, we, we have different ways of expressing it. And these sons have different ways of expressing those hard thoughts very different ways, and yet the same hard thoughts. That's how they're the same. So let's look now at how they express their thoughts, their their their, their hard thoughts of God. The younger son expressed his estrangement from his father by rebellion, open rebellion. By leaving his father, he showed that he did not care for his father or for his father's house. He wanted to be free of him. He didn't want to live in the way that his father lived. He wanted to take what was his and to live in an entirely different way. Now, this is not to say that it is wrong for a son to leave home. Sons are supposed to leave home to join, be joined with their wife and to make a new home. They're supposed to go and establish their own family. But if they leave the way that they were brought up when it was a godly way, then they show great contempt, unjustly so, toward their father. They show that they want to distance themselves from him. They are in rebellion. Surely with God the Father, it is all the more so. To the rebellious sons of God the Father are the ones who reject God's commandments. They say, I don't like these rules. I don't like, I, I'm all bound up by these things. They look at the commandments as it's that which binds them and restricts them and and. and, and distorts everything and and it keeps them from living a full and happy life they look at him as a hindrance they look at their father god the father is a hindrance to their well-being instead of as a gracious help to their well-being it's the only one who can actually give them true life 
But we saw how in God's mercy that this rebellious son woke up, didn't he? What happened? He came to see that there was nothing in the world for him, nothing whatsoever. The world was an empty, barren place. There was nothing there. His eyes were open, and he started yearning for home. That's what wonderfully happens to sinners when God is bringing them to repentance. You begin to realize, I've got nothing here. And they turn to the living God. He realized that it would be better, far better, to be in his father's house as a slave than to be anywhere else as a free man. Do you remember the illustration we looked at last week with the woman from Syrophoenicia who was a Gentile? And she came to Jesus and Jesus said, it's not appropriate to take the children's bread, the, the bread of the Israelites that he, he'd come for, and to give it to the Gentile dogs. And you remember he, he, he said that, and what did the woman say? She said, Lord, even the little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Why did she say that? Because she esteemed that a crumb from this gracious one's table was all that she would need, that it would be fully sufficient for her, a mere crumb. She recognized the value of his grace and of, of what he was giving to his people. And she said, just let me have a crumb that falls. That's how the son came, the, the prodigal son. He had left in his rebellion, not appreciating what he had in the, in the father. And now he realized how valuable it was. And he said, I... I'd rather just, even if I can just be a servant, it would be better to be a servant in my father's house than to be anywhere else in the world. It's like Moses who chose to suffer affliction with the people of God in the wilderness rather than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin for a season in Egypt. As a prince in Egypt, in the highest place in Egypt, he chose rather to go with God because he said it's far better to have crumbs from God than it is to be anywhere else. Now let's look at the elder brother. Let me just add how ashamed the prodigal son must have been when he saw his father's grace that he ever thought, ever had such hard thoughts of his father. I mean, just that he would leave, that he would leave his father's house. He, it must have just it must have pained him. He, when he saw his father's kind reception, who received him not merely as a slave, he wasn't even sure whether he would be willing to do that because of, he, of what he had done, but he received him as a son with rejoicing. Okay, so now let's look at the elder brother. He, is also, he, has, al he has also expressed his estrangement, though in an entirely different way. The older son expressed his estrangement by cold compliance with the father's ways. Isn't that interesting? He felt that if he was faithful and did everything well, he would be accepted. But it seemed that he had no pleasure in doing his father's will and that it seemed to him that he could never do enough to please his father. And indeed, it was not enough. He could not do enough. He could not live up to the perfections of this father, to the character of this father. He could not make himself worthy of this father's love, and he knew it. It made him bitter. It made him bitterly resent his father and look at him as a hard man who could never be satisfied. It made life in his father's house bitter, instead of sweet to him. But he pressed on, pressed on and on and on, always to prove that he was worthy and always knowing that he wasn't and trying to blame it on his father for being so stern and so severe, even when that was not at all true. He was miserable in this service as can be seen by his words. In verse 29, look at what he says. Verse 29, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I have never transgressed your commandments at any time. Now, don't even put that in a super strong way. He's basically saying that he knew he had come short. That's what we're talking about. He knew he didn't measure up. 
But he had not defiantly gone away from his father and done things he knew would displease his father in a defiant way like his brother had done. He had conformed. He had been there all the time doing what his father basically told him to do and seeking to to do what pleased him. He says, and yet, even though I did all this, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. In other words, I tried and I tried and I tried and it's never enough. It's never good enough for you, no matter what I do. What was the problem with this son? He saw his father's high standards. He saw his father's godly character, his father's perfection and righteousness. But he did not see that his father was also a gracious man. He did not see his father's grace. He looked at his father as someone whose love he must earn instead of as a father who would freely extend his love to him. A father who yearned to freely give him all that he needed in order that he might be a pleasing, righteous son. The father was not demanding perfection in that way. He was saying, I know that you don't. I'm, I'm here to provide everything that you need. I am your father. A father who graciously accepted him. This, of course, illustrates the problem that so many people in the church have with God. They're not only defiant or rebellious like the prodigal son, but they have bitter thoughts about God, which thoughts they often try to deny. They do not find service in his house, even when they are serving, a delight, but they find their service to him a grievous burden. His commandments are burdensome to them. They think that they must make themselves measure up to God, but all the while, God is rather calling them, saying, look to me and be saved. That's his call. He tells us that we cannot measure up. Indeed, we cannot measure up. But that he has provided salvation through his son. So why are you trying to measure up when God says, come to me? and I will provide what you need to be right with me. Why did Jesus die on the cross for our sins at all? If we could bring ourselves up to the standard, why did the Son of God leave the glory of heaven and come down to earth and die on the cross? Because we could not pay for our sins. We could not ever pay, no matter what we do, what sacrifices we make, we don't even come close. We could not bear the punishment due to us for them, We simply cannot. Jesus has done that, and he calls us to trust in him, to have faith in him. And why does he give us his Holy Spirit? That we might be born again. That we might be given a new heart that loves God. That he might work in us to sanctify us and to give us a beautiful life, a life such as pleases God the life that he gives to all those who are his. He promises to work in us through the word, sacraments, and prayer by his Holy Spirit, transforming us so that we grow, and at the last, when we see him, we will be made perfect. Salvation is of the Lord. It's not of us. It's not of our striving. Those who strive on their own to measure up, will always be utterly frustrated. Those who strive by laying hold of the Lord instead, will, and, and laying hold of his promises of salvation and grace, will grow. They will grow and grow into his likeness. They will see the gracious and kind acceptance of the Father when they come to him for help and forgiveness and salvation instead of trying to make themselves worthy. It's a whole different way of looking at things. Yes, they want to be pleasing to him because they love him. And they they love the way he wants them to live. They love his commandments. But the way they get there, the way they obtain this conformity to his ways, is by his gracious acceptance of them through Christ. And by his working in their lives by the Holy Spirit. So do you see now why I said that both of these sons were estranged from their father and that both had hard thoughts of him? 
the elder son as well as the younger had hard thoughts. For one, it was expressed by rebelling against him. We sometimes express our displeasure with God by our rebellion. For the other, it was expressed by a miserable compliance, striving to please him. Neither of them liked their father. They both did not like their father. They did not love him. But the younger son came to love him when he went away and came to see the grace that was in his father. This made, and when he came back and saw the grace even more than he ever saw it when he was on the road realizing I'd rather be a slave than in my father's house than in the world. And then he came and saw that his father was willing to make him a son, just like that, without even, before he could even get all his words out. This made the elder son even more bitter and angry. All he could see was works. That's how he was wired up that he had done more than his brother. Yet his brother was accepted apart from his works. While he, the one who had been faithful and who had stayed by everything, he was the one who seemed to be rejected. He could not see that his father was a gracious man. He could not see or understand that his father wanted him to regard him not as a hard, demanding father, but as a gracious, loving father who wants to give his sons what they need. The men at the Tower of Babel wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted to make themselves great. They wanted to make themselves secure that they be not scattered. But God came to Abraham and said, I will bless you. I will make your name great. I will deal with your enemies. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. He did not want the works of the men of Babel God did not want the works of the men of Babel. He wanted to be a father of faith to Abraham. He wanted the faith of Abraham. Abraham believed that God would save him, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Like Paul, he wanted to be found in God his Savior, Christ, not having his own righteousness, which was from law-keeping, but that which... Through, was through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. That's the way that sinners are made righteous, by looking to God to make them righteous rather than looking to their own striving. The elder brother became like Cain. What happened with Cain? Cain saw that his brother Abel's offering was accepted by God, but that his offering was not accepted and that made him angry. We're told why his offering was not accepted. Abel looked for acceptance by faith. He trusted in the promise of God when he brought his offering to God, looking at it as a substitute. He trusted God to make him acceptable through God's saving work, the saving work promised that was the work of Christ. Cain, on the other hand, looked for acceptance on the basis of his own works and his offering. It made him angry when he saw that Abel was accepted and that he was not accepted. Instead of rejoicing that Abel was accepted by grace and saying, I will come to the Father by faith through and receive his grace as well, he killed his brother Abel. God had graciously warned him before he did that. He pled with him and he admonished him not to go in this way of rebellion. But Cain would not listen. The parable of the lost son does not tell us what happened to the elder brother. We don't know what he did. It tells us only of how the father graciously reasoned with him and, and appealed to him. Perhaps Jesus left it open because he knew that some of the Jews who heard him would come to believe, while others would become so bitter that they would do what Cain did, that they would kill Jesus, their brother, who was accepted of God and who had come to save them. Instead of rejoicing that Jesus was accepted, and in his case, not by grace, but because he was a perfect son, they became bitter toward him and said, we are righteous too. They put themselves in competition with the one who had come to save them and therefore would not bow to him for salvation. So they killed him. They wanted to get rid of him because he irritated them and exposed them as not measuring up. 
instead of coming to him that they might be saved by his saving work, they continued to strive and tried to get rid of all memory of him. Now, what about you? This parable was not only presented to those who heard Jesus when he spoke it, it is recorded for us that we might benefit from it today as those have through all of the the years that we might be taught to rejoice in our generous, gracious Heavenly Father. The truth is, okay, let's, let's look at this straight on. The truth is we all have some sentiments toward God that are like those of the elder brother. When his younger brother was restored, when his younger brother seemed to be rewarded, and he was not. Our hearts are exposed when great sinners come to the Father's house and are freely welcomed and received. In some of us, it is because it is an evil heart of unbelief that is exposed in us. In other words, we're not really even born-again people. We're not even regenerate people. Our bitterness is exposed when we see God accepting those who have been worse than we are. And the bitterness, that bitterness will either grow or it will, by God's grace, lead you to repentance. You'll go one way or another. You'll come to be broken and you'll repent or you'll become harder and harder until the day that you meet God in judgment. In others of us, whatever anger it is that, that wells up in us when we see others who seem to be enjoying acceptance of God more than we are, it's the evidence of what we call remaining corruption, corruption that remains in us, remaining sin. None of us is perfect. So we all have some struggle that way. All of us struggle with sin that needs to be rooted out. But as those who are truly in Christ and born of His Spirit, what do we do with our sin? We look to Him to save us from our sin. We look to Him to root out what is wrong in us. So let's look at the elder brother and examine ourselves that we might turn to our Savior for deliverance from this ugly sin of anger when we see others blessed who are great sinners. What do we see about him? First, we see that he was unable to truly delight in his father's gracious character. When you see someone who has lived a very sinful life receive God's forgiveness, it should make you say, Look at, my, look at my Father in heaven. He is so gracious. Here's this one who had rebelled against Him, who had delivered His Son up to be crucified even, and yet He reaches out to Him with grace and receives Him and restores Him. How delightful, what a, what a delightful character that my, my Father, my Heavenly Father has. Instead of being angry with Him, you should look and you should say, Oh Lord, what a gracious Father you are. So kind, so generous, so ready to forgive anyone and everyone that comes to you. It should make you glad. It should make you ready to call on Him yourself. If you see fully and truly that your acceptance, your acceptance is all of grace freely given to you, acceptance that you do not deserve, then you will see your father, great, your father being gracious to a great sinner, and you'll say, there is my gracious God being like himself. Isn't he wonderful, always so kind and so generous? And it will help you then. You'll say, why? You, you'll, you'll say he will accept me if he is accepted. I can always come to him when I repent of my sin, no matter what I have done. That's so different than saying, why would he accept that wretched man over there? Look at all the wicked things that that sinner has done. Why is my life so hard when I've been serving God for all these years and, and, and serving God faithfully all these years and this upstart is freely accepted? What, what is wrong here? So, so what is your response then? What is your response when you see God being gracious? Does it make you happy or does it make you resentful of God? Does it make you resentful when he shows grace to other people? Second, we see that the elder brother was unable to truly delight in the life that he was, had been given to live in his father's house. He had kept his father's commandments, but he had no pleasure 
in his father's commandments. They were a great burden to him. Lo, these many years, verse 29, I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. Can you imagine someone that says, you know, I've been with you all this time and you keep giving me all kinds of gifts and things. And all these years I've been here receiving all these gifts. You know, what, who would say that? Okay, but you see, this is, this is where this guy's coming from. I, I've been here all this time keeping your commandments and you never gave me a young goat that I might make marry with my friends. I've been serving you, could be translated, all these years I have been slaving away for you. And then he complains that he received nothing. He had no use for life in his father's house. It was a drudgery to him, and in his mind, the reward did not equal all the work that he had done. His brother had left because his brother had thought the same thing about the father. This is not a good place. I don't want to stay here. I'm out of here. That's what the brother did. There's nothing here for me in, this, in my father's house. That's what he initially said. Well, this guy thought the same thing. He just had a different response. Now, what about you? Are you unhappy with your life in the house of God? Perhaps you have been serving God, trying to keep his commandments. Maybe you can't find a husband or a wife. Or maybe you have a bad marriage and you'd rather you weren't married at all. Or maybe you're struggling with chronic illness, financial burdens, problems with parents, lack of friends. And you see some upstart who comes to Christ and all of a sudden he's all happiness, all full of praise. Yeah, look what God did. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm, I'm redeemed from my sins and now I can serve God. And you're like, yeah, I've been serving him all these years. And I, my life is going nowhere. I got nothing. It's a mess. Nothing to show for it. All these years. Maybe you don't even mind so much that, that, okay, fine for him. Fine if he got that. I didn't get anything. Terrible attitude. What's wrong? What's wrong with that thinking? What's gone wrong there? The problem is that like the elder brother, you are looking for the wrong reward. The reward of grace is that it brings you to your Father so that you can know the Father, so that you can live with Him, so that you can behold His glory, so that you can see His goodness and His grace, so that you can live in His house and keep His commandments. The reward of grace is that grace enables you to come to God and to serve God. It's not that you come to God and serve God so that you can get a reward. Do you see what I'm saying? The reward is that you come to God and live with God and serve God. The reward is the relationship with the Father where you can serve Him as your God. Serving Him is is not a bad thing that you do to get something else. Serving Him, if you know Him as the God of grace, is the best thing of all. It is the thing. It is the salvation that you came for. The prodigal son wanted his father back because he saw that. He wanted to serve the father. That was his greatest reward, to have the father. Not the fatted calf that he gave him or the, the robe or the, the ring or the emblems of his father's acceptance, but it was life in the father's house that made him glad. He delighted in those gifts because they were emblems of his sonship. Israel missed this when they were in the wilderness. They were with God. He had brought them out of Egypt to serve him, to know him, and he began to reveal himself to them. He gave them his commandments. He gave them the tabernacle with the way of approach to him and how he would provide for them and make atonement for them when they were defiled and unclean. They were with God and able to serve God now. But it seemed to them that life had been better in Egypt. We came out here to serve God, and what do we get for it? We've got nothing. And they grumbled. They grumbled in the wilderness because they were looking for something else, a different reward than the war reward of knowing God and of living for Him. 
of laying down their lives for him. They were unregenerate men. Do you realize what a privilege it is for a sinner to be reconciled to God and to walk with God? We are all sinners, and we're entirely unable to do that apart from his grace. When his grace comes, our delight is not in our health, wealth, and prosperity. Sure, nobody despises health, wealth, and prosperity, but that's not the thing that we came to God for if we came the right way. It's knowing Jesus Christ, knowing the Father and Jesus Christ whom he has sent and walking for him with him in his house forever. It is knowing the power of his transforming grace that enables us to live unto him. Paul said, most gladly will I suffer that I might know him and the power of his resurrection, the power that raised Jesus from the dead, the power that would raise him from the dead and that now gave him new life day by day as he sought to serve God. It was grace, 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 grace to live. The elder son tried to live for God in order to obtain some other reward. But the younger son learned that living for God was the blessing of grace. And he yearned for it when he was away from home and he came and he received it fully when he came to the Father looking to him for mercy and grace. Not, I have done this and this and this and so now you have to give me a reward but I've got nothing and I come to you to receive everything from you because you're a gracious man. That is the way he came. The father, the the elder son, you see, tried to live for God to obtain a reward. But the younger son learned that living for God was the blessing of grace. So the father tries to explain this to his elder son. Verse 31, we saw it already. Son, you are always with me. And all that I have is yours. What's the blessing? You're with me. You're you're with me. People, you can't just go and be with God. You're sinners. But you're with me. I'm with you. Always with the Father. The younger son knew that now. But for the older son, staying with the Father was only a way to get some reward. Being with his Father was just a means to an end. Okay, so this elder son, when his father graciously received his brother, showed that he was unable, first, to rejoice in his father's gracious character, and his father is a person who, who, who is so beautiful. And secondly, he showed that he did not rejoice in the life that the father had given him. To him, it was miserable to live according to his commandments. He just did it trying to get something else. Now, thirdly, See that the elder son was also unable to rejoice in his brother's conversion. He did not love his brother. His thought was, that fellow needs to be punished, not welcomed and rewarded. He did not see that his brother had already been punished. His brother knew that now. His punishment had been his estrangement from the father for those years that he was in rebellion. His father tries to explain that to the elder son when he says, your brother was dead and he's alive. Don't you see? Like when he was gone, he was dead. He was cut off from life. He was cut off from life in our house. And now he's alive. He was lost and now he's found. The elder son did not think that living with the father was a big deal, that it was worth anything. No, that boy that came back, that boy needed to be punished not given any, any feast. I, I don't get a feast. Like, what, what is this about? That was his attitude, running away like that. My brothers and sisters, you should never envy those who are estranged from God. Why not? When they, when they seem to flourish, even though they're committing great sin, you shouldn't envy them because they're estranged from God. And they will remain so if they don't repent. They will end up in the lake of fire if they don't. You get to live with God. You get to serve God. You get to follow God's commandments while they're running around in the muck and the mire. If you know how gracious God is and how excellent the ways of his house are, you will not envy those who are cut off from his house. You will be pleased to be in his house. You will pity them and you will beg them to be reconciled with God through Christ like Paul did. We plead with you. Be reconciled to God. 
to come to God through Christ that they might be made whole. You will also plead with God for them. In other words, you'll pour out ardent prayers that they might be saved. And if they are converted, it will not cause you sorrow and resentment, but great joy. You will rejoice with Jesus and the angels when even one sinner is saved. You will rejoice because you will see yourself not as one who is deprived by serving God, but is one who is now a debtor to everybody else because you have the privilege of, like, I get to live in God's house and other people are outside of the house. I get to have all this blessing. I get to live for him and do his will. He's enabled me to do all of this. And, and all those that are outside of him, they don't have that. You've received such a blessing that, that if anything seems wrong, doesn't seem right to you, It's that you've been given that privilege and they haven't. Not the other way around. For the elder brother, you see, it was just the opposite, though. The whole time his brother was gone, he was not yearning for his brother to be restored and to return, seeing what his brother was missing, because he didn't really think his brother was missing very much anyway. It wasn't that great to be around there anyhow. He kind of, in a way, thought it might be better to be where his brother was. He rather felt like the father owed him a lot. That was his mind. Well, I've been here serving all this time. My father owes me a whole lot. I'm I'm, I'm putting my father in debt because I've been here doing a lot more than that brother of mine. I'm doing more than other people. I keep his commandments. I stayed faithful. I've been here the whole time. Father owes me a lot. Then the brother came and he was accepted. And he's like, Like, what, what is going on here? He felt like the father owed him a lot. I hope this has helped you to see how you ought to rejoice with heaven when a sinner repents and comes to God. If you delight in the grace of God yourself, you will rejoice when sinners are converted and graciously received. But if you're a stranger to grace who is nevertheless striving to keep God's commandments, you will resent it whenever a sinner is saved because you'll feel that God has cheated you. I've been here the whole time, and that guy, he's all happy now and received, and I'm, is no better for me. I say to you all again, the blessing of salvation is to know God and to live for God. That's what we lost in the fall, and that's what he graciously restores to us in salvation. We do not serve God to get something else. We, we come that we might serve God, and that we might know him, and that we might live for him, and in communion and fellowship with him. That's what we lost by the fall, and that's what he restores graciously. Yes, we will be brought to glory, and we yearn for that when there will be no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more death, all of that. But what will make heaven heaven is that the Lord will be there. That will always be the supreme thing. The Lord is there. That was the glory of the temple, the end of Ezekiel. The Lord is there. That's the glory in Revelation at the end of the the whole world, in the new heavens and the new earth that the Lord is there, that we are with him. The the, the Father who is so kind, who is so gracious, so generous, so full of love for his people, and how happy it will make us when we see our brothers and sisters who are gathered around his throne in that day, worshiping before him with no more sin ever in their life, enjoying service to him, loving one another in just the way he commanded, living before him in just the way he commanded, delighting in the Father who has saved them and redeemed them in such a gracious way and becoming like Him. What a beautiful thing that will be and how glad it will make us that, to see others who have received that grace like we have. Please stand and let's call on the name of our God. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the revelation that you have given to us of yourself and of your gracious ways, of your gracious character, of the love that you have for your people and that we ought to have so that we rejoice whenever any sinner repents. Lord, we pray that you would help us to grow in these things, that we would grow in our delight of you, O Father, that we would see who you really are, that we would have no hard thoughts toward you, no bitterness or resentment toward you, for you are a gracious God. You are a holy and pure God. There is no sin in you. There is no fault in you. We pray, Lord, that we would also have a delight in your commandments, 
in living according to your precepts and your laws, that we would not look at them the way the Pharisees did as something that we do to get some reward or get some other benefit, but that the reward itself is that we can live. We remember, Lord, how you spoke in Ezekiel that you, when you found us, you saw us defiled in our blood and you said, live. That was the blessing you gave us, live. And by that word, we were given life that we might be able to come forth out of death and begin to follow you as our Lord and our Savior and our Redeemer. And we thank you, Lord, that, that we're able to enter into your courts and to worship before you and to see who you are and to live in your way. Lord, we confess and fully acknowledge that we do not do that to perfection, but it's not about that. It's about your salvation. You're the one who has taken responsibility to save us. And so we look to you to save us because we cannot save ourselves. We thank you that already we have been fully received on the basis of Christ and his substitution for us, that he in our place is accepted and we are accepted in him. But we thank you that you do not stop there, that you also bring us to perfection by your gracious working. And we pray that that work would continue in a very powerful way, that we would know the power of the resurrection, the, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead at work in us. Father, thank you that your church is ever growing and that the day will come when the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. The day will come when you are perfectly praised and worshiped, when your people are holy and pure, and we live together in perfect communion and fellowship with you forever and ever. Lord, we can't even imagine what it will be like. Oh, how we praise you, Lord. Oh, what wonderful things there will be for us in that day. We look forward to that time when we will see our brothers and sisters gather before you, all those who have been redeemed, and together we sound praises to you and we say, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Oh, Lord, you are worthy, and we praise and honor you. We ask you now to bless us as we come to the table, that you would make yourself known to us, and that you would be pleased to show us clearly that you are the way of salvation, that you are the one who, who saves, who does the saving. We do pray in the name of that Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Receive now the blessing of the Lord our God. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen.